Hello, YouTube family. This is your host, Ronique West of Intellectual Chocolate, and I am so excited. I have Kanji with me. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay, awesome. She is our millennial real estate and chill guru. So, you know, here on Intellectual Chocolate, we like to have conversations with intelligent black minds. Make sure you check out intellectualchocolate.com if you would like to get interviewed here as well. We're going to go ahead and get started into this conversation. Now, my understanding is that, first of all, you bought your first house at 20. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that experience. Okay, so the way that it started was I actually was fascinated because I bought the property in 2005. So I was mm -hmm. fascinated by these flipping shows like on A&E and HGT where it was like HGTV where they were saying like, you know, you can flip a property and put some carpet and paint in and make like 100K. <laughs> so in my mind, I'm a 20 year old college student. Right. Like, oh my God, this is my opportunity. Like I can drop out of school and just flip houses. Right. So, um, so I actually started looking on the market and I found mm -hmm. a real estate agent and my husband and I started, you know, kind of saving a little bit of money. Um, mm -hmm. And we found a condo in Chicago on the south side. Um, we actually, I believe it was a 100 um, percent finance property. We had to pay from closing costs. But mm -hmm. um, back then, the, you know, money was very easy to get for real estate because all you needed was basically a pulse, are you breathing? And can you like sign documents? <laughs> like <laughs> it even loans to like everybody. So yeah. um, I got that property with the intention of flipping the property. I was gonna hold it for a year uh -huh. and really flip it. Um, but it was probably like the worst deal I probably did, my first deal. Um, I actually didn't even know what a special assessment is. So when we sold the condo, mm -hmm. um, um, my, my attorney, he called me at the closing table. He said, I need you to come here because you can't close because you need to bring $1,100 to the closing table. Now, mind you, I thought I was getting like thirteen dollars or $14,000 back, like, you know, from right. the but because the condominium association, they were doing um, uh, basically uh, tuck pointing, a uh, new mm -hmm. roof and a boiler system. So that ate up all of my profits. So yeah. Wow. It was a tough day. Yeah, it was really yeah. tough. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then in the middle of that, we were already closing on another property, another condo. So okay. um, that's, yeah, how that situation went. That's how this is. Now, you said special. Did you say special? In, what did you it's say? A, it's a special assessment. It's when um, your condominium mm -hmm. association has to do like a large um, improvement, meaning like maybe replace all the windows or. Okay. Or, yeah. So they assess every owner like thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars in special assessment fees. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and you got to read all the fine print yeah. and ask a lot of questions, right? Yeah. When yeah. it comes to real estate. So. Yeah. But that's good that you got the experience, I think, yeah, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially yeah. so young. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So then the next condo is when you ended up... Actually making a profit. So okay. because I was buying the next condo from the bank, because it was a foreclosure inside the actual building where we just sold the other property, mm -hmm. they have to actually absorb all the costs of the um, special assessment. So I was mm -hmm. able to get this property without having to deal with that. So... Um, we got that property and we were able to sell that within maybe like seven or eight months. So we made mm -hmm. like a nice profit. And so that kind of built my confidence again, because I was like all the other people that get in real estate and you have your first failure and you're like, oh, this doesn't work. Right. And so um, with the second one, it definitely, you know, made me like, okay, we can do this again. So that was exciting. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So that's good. And so ever since then, you have been, when was the second property? How old were you with the second property? Um, we're probably 21. So okay, yeah. so really, so just you were really like back to back. Nice. Yeah. Now, um, since the end, you look, you're in your 30s right now, and you've been buying houses and flipping them since the end. Flipping and buying, and holding. I started buying and holding in 2012. Okay. So before that, I was just strictly like you know doing flips. But now we do one flip a year, and we do and we have buying holds. So I have like 12 rentals, and then I do one flip a year. So. Okay, yeah. nice. So you always do 12 rentals and then one flip a year. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So then what made you actually get into that, like, actual structure to say, okay, well, we know that we were able to make a profit from this condo. Let's get to the point where we have 12 rental properties yeah. and let's have one hold property. 
-hmm. what made how did you get to that point because i think a lot of people would be interested in hearing that and how was that transition or how did you get to that because like you're kind of like on the trajectory you're on the trajectory that i'm wanting to do because i technically don't never want to like technically live in a house that doesn't really bother me but i do want rental properties you know so i'm like in that process now so talk about that because i'm learning too (laughs) so i mean it's been a definitely a process like it didn't Uh overnight um so when i bought when we got through the condo we bought another property for flipping and things like that Uh but at the time i was still young so i still was like you know um wanted to do the entrepreneurship thing um because like flipping was nice but it wasn't something that was like taking up a lot of my time right so i started actually a staging company for three years Mm -hmm. so I, i had a staging company and i would actually stage and i would also rent furniture so i actually had an office and a warehouse And people would come and they would rent furniture from me. I had a U-Haul truck to, you know, deliver and everything. Okay. And um, so I had a staging business because when I would flip, all the realtors were like, who did the work? Like the staging looks amazing. And I love home and, and, um, you know, home decor and things like Mm -hmm. that. So um, I got into that business. And then when I was like, maybe later, I got pregnant around the same, like maybe in two two years into the business. Uh-huh. put on bed rest and the business pretty much collapsed so okay. um yeah because I was really hands-on and not being able to be there um mm-hmm. I get a lot of people complaining about the delivery being late and um, okay. delivery guys like kind of like um you know not uh delivering it the most professional way and mm-hmm. so many um logistical issues that I had right and it was my baby but I had to let it go because um I just couldn't like do both so right. it kind of taught me the structure of building a business so in the future if I do want to do it I saw some of the pitfalls so once I got done with that so then I was bored again mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I had a baby well, it must be good when you get bored because you come up with a lot of stuff <laughs> so I got bored and then also so we were still like flipping so my mom would watch the baby and my husband and I would be doing a little flipping thing but um I also was like trying to live up to other people's expectations so I was getting a lot from my parents because I think people were still like what do you do all day like they they couldn't get it like (laughs) so um then I went to a law school because my parents had always told me like you're gonna be an attorney you're gonna be an attorney like that I've been hearing that all my life so Mm -hmm. I I took the LSAT oh wow yeah I took the LSAT Got into law school, went to John Marshall Law School. Mm-hmm. I went there for a year, but my heart wasn't in it. Like, even with mm-hmm. the study groups, they would be like, you're looking at real estate again. Like, you're going to wind up, like, not failing. You're not going to pass the test because you're not paying attention. You're looking at, like, why are you looking at these parts? They couldn't get it because right. they were like, that was their passion. They were into it. So that's when I realized, like, I can't, like, march to the beat of someone else. Which I have to kind of, like, do what my heart tells me to do. Mm-hmm. So that's when I just kind of like, okay, I can't keep running from it. I love real estate. And so that year I decided to just more become a landlord Mm because I like the residual income. I mean, the, you know, making a profit from a flip is nice, but -hmm. there's a lot of tax implications with that. Okay. Capital gains and things, different things like that. So being a landlord makes it much easier. And then just, you know, being able to have that, you know, check every first of the month is, mm-hmm. it's really a direct deposit from section eight and, and the market tenants. So, so that, you know, is why we kind of went the landlord route and a little bit of flipping on the side. So. Okay. So now are all your properties in the Illinois area or are they? Uh, they are. Okay. 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 And then you got into, you said section eight. So you have some properties that are section eight qualified or what is the correct terminology for that? Yeah. So section Mm -hmm. eight qualified. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then how does that process work or can you go into that? So just in case anybody that's listening or our viewers listening are really interested and they want to really know how to get into this because you were young and most entrepreneurs, they have different, you know, perspectives throughout life meaning you may start one thing and it may fail but as long as you keep going you will figure out what works for you and I think that's just part of the journey right you start somewhere and then you continue to go so maybe talk a little bit more about that for our viewers because I think they probably would be interested in that yeah and I'm interested in it too look (laughs) yeah so section eight I know people have like a lot of negative connotations about it but Mm -hmm. I think it's one of our most lucrative, um, you know, as far as uh, income strategies is Section 8, um, particularly if you do Section 8, if you live in a big metropolitan area. I really don't see the upside of it when you live in like a suburb surrounding. So, for instance, I, I, a lot of my Section 8 properties are in Chicago. Chicago, okay. because of that cost of living is so much higher, they pay me a lot higher on my rent 
than versus what I would get with a, if I marketed to a regular market tenant. So I'm talking about you could be in the hood of the hood of Chicago, mm. like Inglewood, like gunshots everywhere, like very, very poor, you know, depressed areas. And they will give you for a four bedroom, you can get like $1,600. Okay. So, yeah, so uh, that's why I like Section 8. Now, with Section 8, um, you have to uh, advertise it. Um, and once you get somebody that is has a Section 8 voucher, that's when you take it to them. So you don't, like, get your building ready and, and walk up to the, you know, housing authority and say, hey, I want to, mm-hmm. um, you know, get a tenant. No, you have to find a tenant that says they like the property. And once you qualify them, and usually what I usually do is just, like, um, I'll just run a short um background check Mm -hmm. not a real thorough one only because section eight already has done that legwork right um so i'll run like a small uh, background check just to make sure that it's nothing like recent like an eviction or anything like that um on there and then what you'll do is you'll turn the paperwork in um they do one thing i don't like about section eight here in Mm -hmm. chicago i don't know if it's for all housing um authorities but they actually disqualify you if you have a felony. So I don't like that because it's like mm-hmm. if someone is coming out of jail and they want to be a landlord and they have property they may have inherited, they right. can't section eight because they have a felony. Like I just oh, think wow. that's, yeah, so, that's perfect. so they can't be so they have a felony, they can't do have a section eight property that they rent out. They can't, no. They wow. Don't. Yeah. Now yeah, that's I'm gonna look at the rules. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I have to look at the rules in Georgia and see what the rules are here because I'm pretty sure it's probably different per jurisdiction. Yeah, exactly. But that that limits income when you know they probably can't get a job anyway, but they could do rental properties and they can't even do that. Exactly, exactly. And that's, a, like I said, it's a very lucrative way. And mm-hmm. you can, like, um, for instance, if you're in Chicago, and I kind of rent in like a BC neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So some of my properties are called opportunity areas, meaning that, Mm-hmm. Um, the properties are in great areas. They have access to, sh- to shopping, good schools, right? Things like that. So what Section Eight will do for me is they will pay me even more. Mm-hmm. They will also give me a ta- property tax rebate. So a lot of times they'll give me five or six hundred dollars yearly off of my taxes because they feel like you're doing us a favor by allowing you people to rent in such a nice neighborhood. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So all the perk to um, Section Eight, but this is my disclaimer with Section Eight. My mm-hmm. husband and I both have agreed that it's about 20, 30% of them are good tenants. The other 70, so you have to be extremely careful. Right. To, to them. Um, the, uh, my book kind of goes along about like how well I screen. I probably have two chapters dedicated to it. Mm-hmm. But your screening has to be on point because it can be disastrous if you don't. If you just pick anybody with a voucher, it can be a major headache. Um, Section 8 in itself causes more of a hands-on management to me versus my marketing tenants, They, uh, the regular market tenants. They won't call as much. But with the Section 8 tenants, they're calling about a light bulb. They're calling about the most innocuous things. Really? Wow. Of where the market tenant is, they're going to they're gonna troubleshoot for you. Uh-huh. They're going to make sure they can kind of do some things before they, like, bother you. And they're coming mm-hmm. out their own pocket. Whereas Section 8, they might be paying $60 in rent, but they're calling you about small things. Everything. Oh. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. That's good information, though. Okay, so guys, if you're just following us or joining us, we're on Intellectual Chocolate. Make sure you go to intellectualchocolate.com. I'm your host, Ronique West. I'm talking to Panji. She is the Real Estate and Chill author. She's telling us all about real estate today. She's in Chicago doing amazing things, and so I'm learning a lot. Because uh, I'm getting ready to get into real estate here myself very soon. Uh, so this is all good information. So your book, let's talk a little bit more about what's in the book before we go into, I know you will do a class, which I'm so interested in. So we'll save that for later. But the book, so you did mention that you talk about being a landlord and yeah. then screening your tenants. Mm-hmm. And because um, I know I've always thought about doing Section 8 property as well, just because of Opportunity Zone, I think that's what they call it in our area. I'm pretty sure that's mm-hmm. what it is. And, you know, just making sure I get that guaranteed rent without yeah. having to do a regular market client. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that was kind of like my reasoning for it, thinking like investing wise. Now, what else does your book cover? What other chapters are in there? Um, I also talk about flipping. So um, I'll talk about flipping and some of the materials you should use, Mm -hmm. um, dealing with contractors and, you know, making sure like, cause that's one, another like, um, challenge with real estate is finding reliable contractors 
and making sure that you know um, you document everything. Also making sure that when you're dealing with contractors, you want to make sure you know the stuff that are working on your property. Because what can happen, and um, this happens in different states, where if the subs are not paid and you paid the contractor, they can come after you and put a lien on your real estate. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, they can. And it has happened. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that when you're paying this contractor, all the subs are standing around and you have them sign as well, saying that they've been paid in full. Because there are some very bad contractors that will literally have these people do work and then they will get the check and will not pay their um their workers. So, but you're going to be on the hook because the subs are going to come after you. So I talk about dealing mm -hmm. with contractors. I talk about dealing with different agents. Um, in my experience, I think that if you're new a newbie and you're trying to get into real estate investing, I think you should try to find a real estate agent that's actually an investor. Okay. Because I feel like they have the eyes of an investor and they're going to take their time with you as opposed to an agent that might just try to put you into a property because they're sick of showing you properties. Like my agent has been so patient with me. Like I might look at 60 properties, I might ask for 60 lockbox codes and they're fine with it. Uh -huh. But some agents don't want to do that type of, you know, right. they kind of just like want to push you into something and get you to sign that document. So I think, you know, um, I talk about that. Um, I talk about, you know, some of the, you know, red flags that I see when I'm screening different tenants. Um, I also talk about some of the systems I put in place as far as like when you're, you know, rehabbing your rental properties, you probably just want to use the same materials. I've, I've found that that's much easier. So the same paint, the same cabinetry tile, I think it just makes it much easier. It takes the guesswork out of it. Right. Touch-ups, you just know you have that same paint color and different mm -hmm. things um and then also it just helps you um extend the like the, the the um the quality of the you know the rehab because obviously mm -hmm. when you have turnover you have to keep fixing things but if you get quality products in the beginning and see what works and what doesn't work so if you bought a cheap faucet in the beginning don't buy that again right to get something better because you want it to long you know last long and you don't want to have to keep rehabbing your property so i'll talk about those tips um because at the end of the day you want to maintain your tenants vacancy mm -hmm. is like the worst um if you don't have to have it like i try to maintain my tenants if they're good tenants now if they're mm -hmm. horrible you want them out of there but, right you know, um, let's talk about delinquent rent and dealing with you know different things as far as eviction cash for keys I don't know if you guys have cash for keys in Jordan. Have you ever heard of that? I have not heard of that. Okay. What is that? So cash for keys is, is used in different states. Like for instance, mm -hmm. we use it here in Illinois because we are a tenant friendly state. Okay. Meaning all the laws are basically in the favor of the tenant. So mm -hmm. our eviction process here in Chicago is very lengthy and expensive. And mm -hmm. if you lose, you can actually pay the, the fees of the um, tenant. Oh. So the legal fees. Mm -hmm. And so, um, even if they didn't pay rent and mm -hmm. let's just say it's like maybe like December. Well, they may not leave until like April or May because the, 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 the court system as well as the sheriff's department, right. they don't like to evict people during winter time. So what do you do when you have someone squatting in your property, not paying rent for four or five months by law, because mm -hmm. it's just, because it's cold outside. So what a lot of, um, you know, uh, landlords here, what we'll do is we'll say, look, I'll give you $900 or $1,000 and you have to move everything out and I'm going to pay you the sub of money. And I think when you do this, um, you need to talk to an attorney to make sure you have, you know, all your, you know, it's a legally binding. Um, I wouldn't say go print it off Google Docs or anything like that. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Um, go talk to an attorney to make sure it's done correctly. But that's what we do here in Chicago. Um, if you don't want to go through the long court system, because uh, it can be very expensive to pay your attorney to keep going and showing up for the process and different right. things like that. So, but if you're in a landlord friendly state, you're fine. You don't need that. So. Right, 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 right. I think we're probably landlord friendly right now. I haven't really looked at the thing, but it's pretty standard, kind of like it was in Indiana. I don't think we're in a Oh, Indiana is great. Now, the yeah. only reason why I won't go over there is because um the I can't get the same rent amount. So like okay. if you're in Chicago for a three bedroom, one bath might be like mm -hmm. eleven $1 hundred or twelve hundred dollars. Over there I can only get like maybe seven hundred top. Oh. So, okay. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah. Is there a website you can go on and look at the information or okay, so if you go to Zillow, mm -hmm. it will kind of show you what the ranges are for rent. And okay. 
help you um, kind of, you know, determine what you get. Also, if you advertise it, like if you um, put it in, if you or if you're looking for a rental, just to mm -hmm. see what other people are putting now, you can compare, and that can that can kind of give you an idea of what you should be as far as rent. Um, exactly. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. You're giving us a lot of great information. So now let's get into how did you, because I read a little bit about your bio and you just really talking about your passion about millennials understanding real estate and that they can really get into this to yeah. build. And you, you talked a little bit about your parents, you know, kind of really kind of forcing you to kind of go to school. And I talk a lot about that mindset of teaching our kids to go to school and retire those days are over with like you can't really do one thing anymore and retire you know they were in a different generation than what we're living in i'm generation x but i know you're a millennial and then even generation behind you but we were the first generation where we didn't have the long-term careers we got we got stuck in it the trajectory changed right our trajectory is changing during our lifetime so we're like in the process of figuring it all out and changing course you know, after we probably done worked about 15 or 20 years and then the economy's changing. So now we're like, oh, we got to shift. Exactly. So I think, you know, we have to shift as a community. So I love your story because it's really teaching people that, hey, you can be an entrepreneur. You have 14 years in, you, you know, you got a house. It was a bad deal. You got a house. It was a good deal. Now you're having rental properties out the wazoo. And then you have one property that you hold, you really have. And then you had a business that you had that was staging. So it really shows that trajectory. And then law school didn't work out for you and you knew it, even though you have to sometimes go against what your parents think, because I think a lot of our older generation is still thinking like this is the way things are. And it's not. I just read a report the other day and was listening to Dr. Henderson, who studies um, economy and everything in Mississippi. And he was just saying that the report and most reports are saying this when I looked it up the next five years that most people that have jobs, I think it was like about 30 or 50 percent of jobs are going to be gone. Wow. The next five years, starting 2017, like, and on, because of things are changing so much, so people will have to develop different skill sets um, so that they can be marketable in the new economy. Yeah. And a lot of people are not talking about that. So I just love this story because we have to begin to spread this message so people won't be taken by surprise, especially right. with artificial intelligence and so forth that is here already. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the thing about real estate is that you really don't need a lot of skill to get into it. And a lot mm -hmm. of times you can do real estate. Like I always suggest, like if you want to get started in real estate, I say get like a two to four unit building. If you mm -hmm. don't own any property already, you can, you can get an FHA loan and put 3% down. That's a great way to start. You live in one unit, you rent out the three other ones, right? Mm -hmm. They can pay your rent and they may, you may have something left over. I mean, your mortgage and you may have something left over to start saving for the next property. Right. Um, but specifically what I've started doing on my Instagram is I started showing how easy it is to get in real estate in terms of in our neighborhoods. I think obviously just like um, any other resource in black neighborhoods, especially mm -hmm. in the depressed areas, um, everything is undervalued. And mm -hmm. like I'll show properties where there's like, on, you know, on the south side of Chicago, five thousand dollar property. $3,000 properties, $10,000 properties. And I try to tell people, you can partner with people. Like if it's $5,000, $2,500, $2,500. Right. Like, I own a piece of real estate. I like to also share this story that I um, recently, you know, um, mm -hmm. experienced about a couple years ago. I bought a property that was advertised for $7,000 and it got bid up to $10,000. Um, and uh, some kind of way, um, the property was actually, the city of Chicago actually put like a, made me go to housing court for it because it was a vacant property and I didn't register it. I didn't know I had to register a property that was vacant, but right. I learned quickly. <laughs> anyway, I was talking to, I was there and I was um, with my husband, we were doing a little work outside, cleaning it up in the outside. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids came over and they were like, yeah, my landlord really wanted this property. He was really upset that he didn't get to have it. And so when we Google the, 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 his land, you know, we just Googled mm -hmm. the person that owned the property from the little kid and coming to find out he owned eight properties on the block. 
some white guy that lived in a really great suburb on the north side and he was getting section eight of all these pro- and he felt like it was his it was an entitlement to have this property but i shared that because i wanted them to know that everyone else is reaping the benefits of our neighborhood and our park he's sitting up pretty living right. very closely in the suburbs owning these properties for cheap while the city of chicago is probably giving him 12 to 1400 dollars per house mm. and we're not buying our own properties this is simple to get into ten thousand dollars i mean come on like Some of us might get that back from an income tax check. So that's why I like to share that story is that it doesn't take a lot of money to get into this property. Now, yeah, we might have to put an additional Mm $10,000 in there, but you're not, where else are you going to get returns like that? We're getting about $1,000 a month on that property. It's a small two bedroom and bath, but it's it's a very, you know, it's passive income. So, yeah. Right. And I think that's just because we, you know, I always think about like just growing up. These are not things conversations I had with my parents. Like they definitely never talked to me about money, really, for the most part. Even though I was in a two parent household, um, but I, that was not ever a conversation I had. Even entrepreneurship, I didn't learn about entrepreneurship until I was like in my thirties, so that I could even you know run my own business. And so those type of conversations I think are so crucial to having. So I thank you for sh- uh, sharing your story and even talking about him. Like I think of the, I think that hood the hood our yeah. hoods were not always the hood yeah and they were manufactured yeah. and on top of that on on the fact that when i look at i was looking at like my great grandfather's picture of his house when he first yeah. bought it and i remember looking at the picture and looking and it was like the picture of the street and i was like this doesn't even look like the same house like it isn't like the same neighborhood like this looked like the, it looked like the suburb yeah it's a hood today but when he first bought it i swear it and i was just like how in the heck did that happen and then like our hoods were destroyed but then on top of that now that they're hoods they're still taking money from them. exactly that is crazy exactly exactly yeah and so we have to like really begin to think differently so intellectual chocolate family you just joining in with us i have Ponji. she's the real estate and chill gurus what i'm calling her she is focusing on millennials and making sure they understand about getting into real estate and it doesn't really take a lot of experience not even a lot of capital tax time is coming up i think i'm gonna do like a whole thing about this tax season and what you should do with your money right. <laughs> like i don't know if we can do like we a campaign it. or something i think we need to yeah but that's kind of like my uh objective that just kind of popped in my head when you said yeah. that because a lot of people do and then they spend their money yeah. but if you take part of that money like 2500 get somebody or 5000 some people do get 10000 back yeah. um you know take 5000 and get a property yeah at least you'll have something to stand for yeah. that next year when tax season comes again yeah. right and sometimes i think it's scary so maybe we can talk a little bit about that um process and then like you kind of getting over maybe the 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 i think sometimes you're scared to go into something new Maybe yeah. talk a little bit about that, and then let's talk about the class. Yeah. After that. Um. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think it's fair in it, and I think you mm-hmm. know, um, having a partner alleviates that if you can. Um. But if you do mm-hmm. have to go at it alone, I mean, I think uh the best thing you do is just research as much as possible. Right. Um, even when you are t- t- trying to buy the property, talk to some of the neighbors and just kind of get a feel about the neighborhood and things like that. A lot of times I, what I do on Instagram, I put it out there because I know that this is somebody's grandma's block or the, a mm-hmm. block that they live on or a family. You know what I mean? So okay. even if you don't live in the hood, I know you know some family that lives in the hood, right? Mm-hmm. So why not buy where your relative lives? And that kind of right. takes some of the angst away because you know they can kind of look out for you. They can tell you what's going on. But um, when you are buying properties that are vacant and you don't have a tenant and it's not tenant occupied, um, I definitely suggest that you make sure you lock up the property. A lot of times in the hood, um, what I've noticed is they're taking like the copper piping. So going with like a simply safe system is a great thing. What I like, it's like a traveling security system and it costs me $14.95 a month, but you basically um, install it yourself and it has like um, monitors that you put on the windows and the doors and things like that. And if that's ever triggered, it will call the police and it will also call you. Oh, okay. 
nice you can also, they also have a camera system with it that costs like a couple hundred dollars more mm -hmm. um but it's yours and you keep it you know for a lifetime but you can also you know if it's something that where it's a really scary neighborhood you can do the camera system and you can you know look on your phone and you can just check your property at all times um yeah, so I just think like, and maybe if you even want to visit the police station and talk to them about, you know, what's going on with the area. But um, I don't think that we should be scared to invest in our own neighborhoods. Um, even when I'm going into these neighborhoods, um, I like to talk, like get a rapport with them. Like, so I think that you shouldn't just be like going up to the house and not speaking. Like if you can give your car to, to one of the neighbors and do that. And even like um, with some of the younger kids, so, cause our block, um, the one that's particularly one that's in like the hood hood, um, there are a lot of children and stuff. And so right. they are always curious and you know, they want to come and help out. So we'll give them like little jobs to do, like maybe picking up the mm -hmm. paper or, you know, picking some weeds out. I think it just like builds some type of, you know, bond with, you know, the block. And I think they respect you more and they'll look out for the property more. Right. Plus, just giving back. Because some some of these children have never seen a male before. Like, my my husband was showing them the drill gun and showing them how he was putting in the exterior door and he was showing the nails and the drill. Like, they hadn't even seen that before. And these were like, right. you know, boys. So I think that it's really important to give back in that type of way. So mm -hmm. you don't have to have money, but if you have time to show a little boy a skill, you need to do it. Like you, you really should do it. I get so much pride when we renovate these properties and people walk up to us like, oh my gosh, you guys did such a great job. Really. It looks really great. You guys improved the neighborhood. Like that's so rewarding for me. So yeah, just, you know, trying to do things like that will help. Right, you. right, right. So now if I get your book and I've never purchased a property, am I going to be able to read the book and then come out with getting a property that like that's one of the questions I'm thinking. <laughs> I definitely think you will have the confidence. I and the thing about okay. it is like I mean, I really talk about the nuances. I really dive in. Okay. Also if you're not a book reader, I have it on audio as well, iTunes and um, Amazon. But if the um I talk about even screening properties. So for instance I talk about making sure that you're not buying in like flood zones. Mm -hmm. Flood zones can be really difficult to get insurance on your property. Um, I talk about, you know, buying properties and making sure that you're looking at the property taxes. Like, even if something is $10,000, if it has $10,000 in annual property taxes, that's probably not a good deal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so you just need to, like, I, I talk about all those things that you should be looking for when you're looking for a good candidate for a property. Because not all properties are suitable for renting or flipping, you know? Right. So I, I do go through the nuances of that. Okay. But, so now with the, do you have tax liens? And then I, I hear about wholesaling now. Is yeah, that? So I okay. I'm wholesaling. I don't have any okay. deals with it, but I do have a lot of wholesalers that will call me with okay. deals or text me and let me know. So that's a great way. Like if you feel like you're looking for a property and let's just say on the MLS, you're not finding anything and on Zillow, um, contacting a wholesaler can be a great way. And also if you want to be a wholesaler, I hear you can, you know, make a good profit from that as well. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, because I hear a lot of people are, like, going into being a wholesaler, I guess, is yeah. what they're doing, and, they, and they're making a lot of good profits. Yeah. So, okay, so now I'm so excited that you have decided to set up class once a month Yeah. yeah. In, your, uh, in the south side of Chicago, is that my understanding? It's Courtly, so yeah. Courtly, okay, okay, and where's that at? Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so I'm doing the class uh, at the Croc Center, so it's like a classroom, and maybe it seats about 30 something people okay so yeah we, we do that and I just talk about and ask I let people ask as many questions as they want to but we talk about just getting into real estate on um, what areas they should be looking at I talk about up and coming areas mm -hmm. and um, some of the laws and because the laws here in Chicago can be strict for landlords so I just go through all the details about um, buying real estate but then it can the class is also general as well because it can be applied to any state so um, mm -hmm. if I show it on YouTube, it's still applicable to other people that are investing outside of, you know, Illinois or Chicago. So, right now the class is it, is it once you said it's once a month and then there's, it was the fee for it or what you oh, were no, thinking the about is free. The class, oh, the class is, free. is free. Okay. And it's quarterly. So it's like every four months, but it's, it, it's free. Mm -hmm. Um, I was teaching also in the black real estate school with Andre. Okay. So I was doing class for um, him as well, teaching a couple classes in there as well. But uh -huh. the Chicago is the one that's quarterly and it's completely free. 
nice um, and ask questions and it's two hours so you know i have refreshments and things like that so okay good good so you really you get fed yeah. you get refreshments you don't get a full meal you get refreshments yeah. You get a lot of knowledge about real estate. You also learn how to really purchase your um, first property if you haven't got it. So maybe we should issue out a challenge, I feel like, uh, when we get ready to close out this video to get everybody to like really look into getting their very first property. Now, if you don't have good credit or whatever, what are some maybe some options for people who are in that situation or they're trying to get, like they're not going to be able to get a bank loan? Um, do you know about it? Can you talk in, into that a little bit? I mean, I definitely think you should visit a loan officer to see where you stand. Mm -hmm. I think that visiting them and having a consultation, mm -hmm. um, because it's nothing worse than being in the dark about whether or not you qualify. So mm -hmm. you may qualify credit school wise, but maybe you don't like have the actual down payment. So it gives right. you like a goal to work towards. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm like dealing with a cold. <laughs> but, um, I'm going to get better. Definitely. If you need to take something to drink, go ahead. Definitely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, so if also another thing, um, when you're dealing with a loan officer, inquire mm -hmm. about any type of um, grants that they may have. So for instance, we have a lot of depressed areas that are up and coming, like the, the neighborhood in Woodlawn where we're getting the Obama Foundation Library. Okay. They're giving out um, grants for people that are buying over there for them to develop the area. So you just never know where you might want to actually, you know, invest in. They mm -hmm. may have some incentives for you to invest. Right. Um, if you don't uh, have the credit, I say work on the credit, get, get with someone who can help you build your credit so you can actually qualify for something. Mm -hmm. I personally, <coughs> I'm sorry, suggest that like if, you, if you're open to it, save your money and self-finance. Okay. The people. Because I think that um, it's great to start out with a loan in the beginning, Mm -hmm. But to let them keep going, I think they use the best way is to actually self-finance it because you reap the reward. The rewards are better. I don't like the idea of over-leveraging yourself. Right. Um, I see too many people that will grow so fast. And if you get three or four vacancies, the house of cards comes down. Right. You know? Right. And that's, that's I'm, and sometimes I, and, you know, I will encourage counter people that have such a jaded idea about real estate mm -hmm. and the reason why is because they grew too fast oh and you, you take out all these loans and you you know and then next thing you know if you're only making two or three hundred dollars a month after you pay your i mean to me it's i wouldn't i don't like that way of investing everybody right. has their own strategy i like the way that i invest i feel like i reap the rewards better it gives me a better lifestyle so mm -hmm. I personally, you know, if you will want to take the time out and just buy something that is just, you know, um, a cheaper property and then maybe take a loan, a, a loan out and then just finance the other ones and just have that one loan and just the rest of you self finance, yeah. I would prefer to go that way. I'm just not a fan of getting a um, million dollars worth of, um, you know, mortgages mm. and, and then, you know, uh, only making small margins off of that. So right, right, right. Because you only make like so much back if you're right. Because the mortgage and then all your fees. So you may get like two or three hundred back, or if that much, one fifty a lot of times, right? That you maybe right. So I love that because that's kind of like the scenario I'm going into. Like, how do I begin to self finance after I do the one loan, but only hold the right. loan at a time? That's why we have to do. Yeah. That's why in my plan, I have to do the one flip per year. Because right. It allows me to keep bankrolling and be my own bank. Right. Because otherwise, I'd have to go to a bank. And I don't want to do that. My goal is to be able to leave all of my real estate mortgage mm -hmm. free to my children. And mm -hmm. if they, even when I'm alive, if they come to me and they say mm -hmm. to me, I want to have this business, I want to be like the parents of Jeff Bezos. I want to write that check for $250,000. Yes. If they come to me and they want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, I want to write that check. Because mm -hmm. we know that, you know, as I have two boys, black males walking into a bank and asking someone to finance their dream, it's not going to happen. Right. So I don't want anything holding them back from that. And so that's, that's why I invest the way I do. So. Nice, nice, nice. Now, do you do any like personal consultations or anything? I just thought about that when you were talking. People ask me that all the time. I'm trying, okay. to, get, I'm trying to get my coaching website um, up. 
So I should mm-hmm. have it done by the end of the year. But yeah, I get that email all the time. Like, do you do coaching one-on-one sessions? So yes. Right. That's yeah, I think you probably really should get into that. Cause like even your um the way that your trajectory is and the way that you have built your business model is like different than a lot of real estate uh gurus I'm hearing from. Yeah. You know, and I love that idea because that was always that's always been kind of my hold up. I'm like, I don't want to be in a bunch of debt. I don't want to have like four mortgages and I like to live. I mean, I like to travel. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to be like up at night, like, oh my goodness, I have four vacancies. I got to put someone in there. Now right. Take my time and I can take two or three months to, to fill a vacancy. Right. Like, you know, I don't, I don't feel any type of rush. I don't lose any sleep at night. Mm-hmm. But if you have all these mortgage properties, believe me, you are going to be stretched. You're going to have gray hairs. <laughs> you have gray hairs, right. <laughs> and I don't want any of those. So if you just join us, I am talking to Ponji. She wrote a book on real estate and chill. She's a millennial that is making strides in Illinois. She's a real estate guru already at a very young age and has owned several properties, her and her husband and her family. And she's teaching entrepreneurship, real estate, and everything you can know. So I'm learning a lot from this young lady. Guys, today I'm taking it all in. Make sure you follow her on Instagram at Real Estate and Chill. Um, We're having a conversation all about real estate. So if you're just joining us, make sure you go back to the beginning because you want to hear everything that she gave. She dropped some jewels today. So now, any last words you have for our viewers or any things you want to leave us with? Well, I think that real estate, I think most people in America have gotten rich off real estate. And there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. So I, even if you have a bad experience, like I had in the beginning, keep going. Don't let one bad tenant like discourage you from like, you know, keeping your real estate, hold on to your real estate. Don't sell your real estate unless you're trading up for another asset. But right. start small. I really believe that real estate is a marathon and not a race. So don't go into it thinking like, oh, well, I want in the next two years, I want to have 50 units. Start small because it's, it, you know, it takes time to manage that amount and finance that amount. So, you know, do it, you know, at your own pace and um, definitely, you know, um, don't over leverage yourself. Right. But, yeah. But I think that, you know, um, real estate is a great way to pass down generational wealth. And then when you when you want to create that one thing that I'm making sure that, you know, we indoctrinate our children into the, our real estate, because I see a lot of pe- families will have real estate mm-hmm. and they kind of are steering their children towards the more um, educational route. So what will happen is they'll inherit these properties and they want they want nothing to do with these properties. They sell them. Yeah. They don't really value in them. Or they lose them because they don't pay the property taxes on them. Mm-hmm. And so what we're trying to make sure is that we make sure our sons are included in the process. You know, when they get uh, in the teenage years, I want them to go and collect rent and, and deal with tenants one-on-one. I really want this to be a family business. And I just want to make sure that, you know, that other black millennials, as you're building your portfolio, make sure your children are included in this because that's the only way that it's going to be able to survive the next generation. Otherwise, your children might drop the ball And, you know, that all that work that you did to, you know, have a solid foundation for wealth Mm -hmm. is gone in one generation. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting. You brought that up because I do see that a lot, especially um, older. Like we have a um, I'm kind of in an area where we have everybody, but we do have an older population too that gets a lot of attention they doing a lot of different things a lot of times their homes their families don't want to deal with it or their families don't know what's going on so you're trying to get them out the property because they're living off social security and so then the house is just like gone you know so i love the fact that you're talking about like it's very important you intrigue your kids into this and i think there's a gap right now that's happening that I see, and I'm like, the older generation is not like involving even my generation or the younger generation into certain things that they should be so they can be passing down. Even if you don't pass down to your family, it may be somebody that you know that you trust that's been around you for a while that you can still pass that down to where it doesn't just go to the city Absolutely. or it doesn't become a vacant house or a lot or whatever. Yeah, that or you see happen. Yeah, tax lien that happens all the time. Yes, and I'm yes. just like, whoa, like what where where are we missing the boat at? So I'm happy you brought that up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We have generational wealth in the black community. We lose Big Mama's house. And that's that's what's happening. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know if you um if you look at some of Chicago like articles around tax time, they talk about how in the black neighborhoods on the on the south and the west side, we have some of the large the our Cook County 
you know, has some of the largest places where the properties are lost for $1,100. And when you go to these tax sales, you see nothing but Jewish white people just standing there buying up all these tax liens because they have large amounts of capital. Right. And, and they're getting our properties for pennies on the dollar. And so wow. the wealth is there. We're losing it. We're losing it because we're not telling our children how to maintain these properties. So Right. And how to maintain it and be involved and not just move to the suburbs and then yes. forget the hood. I always tell, you know, that's so funny that you say that because I always talk about, I'm like, guys, because if you really look at everything between gentrification and like they're buying up all our properties, now they're coming back to the hood and they're, you know, and now they're moving us out. I was like, we ain't gonna have no neighborhoods. No. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know if anybody thinking about that. I'm like, literally, like you wanted to get to the suburb. That was the thing to get out the hood or whatever. And then the way, the older I'm getting, I'm like, Man, I need to be back in the hood. I need to be buying properties. I need to be living there because we're not going to have any place to go. Every like, time we get sick of living somewhere, they move us out of it. Right. So 15 years from now, when they get sick of living in the city and they want to go back to the burbs, they're going to move us out. So they're going to move us back out. And they'll move, it's like a migration. Exactly. exactly. And, I'm like, and I'm like, I wonder, do we pay attention to that? Because that's happening. And I'm like, no, let's, let's buy. Let's hold. Say, no, this is our neighborhood. And you, and that's, uh, that's what I talk about because um, not only are you leaving your real estate, you're also mm -hmm. leaving, um, you're diminishing our political power. Right. So we saw that here in the city of Chicago because when so many blacks, and I, I get it because they say, well, I'm leaving because I'm sick of the shooting. I'm sick of my baby not being safe. Right. So I get it. And so what happens, but what happens is voting time comes around and we don't have, the power is diminishing, especially in Chicago. We used to be really strong and had a, a you know, strong voting mm -hmm. block here. But it's diminished because we moved out of the city of Chicago. Yeah. Right. To be safe. And then we don't think about things like that and how the trajectory affects yeah. us later. Because even with, if you had a strong voting block, you probably, like you talked about earlier, with the felonies not being able to take part of rental or a Section 8 rental or becoming that landlord for Section 8 because they have a felony, like that's something you could fight exactly. for legislation. But you can't if you don't have a, a voting block, which is happening here in Georgia. Like we have one city that I was reading up on, well, my senator, I do talk to senators and stuff a lot in Georgia because I'm starting to understand how much politics goes into business and community. I don't care. Even if you don't like it, you got to understand it. Right. We have one city that's within another city. Like, it's like a little a zip code. They decided this year that they didn't want to be part of the other part of the city. Of course, it's mostly the um, rich white folks. They're in a black, like, it's like a black area too, but the, like everybody, like, it's pretty middle class or rich, but the pe the white folks there decided they didn't want to be part of the city anymore. And they fought to get it on a ballot to literally become its own city within a city. Wow. To control its own politics, policy, have its own commission, everything. Now, it got voted down, but they had to go through this process to literally, like, they put, they put up a foundation and everything. Wow. Like, so we, like, we trying to get to their neighborhoods. Like, uh, like I want our people to understand that we're trying to get to their neighborhoods. But they don't even want to be part of us. No. Like, they don't show you right there that they literally was like, we're going to draw a city within this city. And we want our own everything. But they want their own tax dollars. They want their own commission board, their own mayor within a city. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not even surprised by it. But I think that's another strategy that Black people can use themselves. I right. I learn from that. But yeah, um, I think that, yeah, I'm not even surprised that they would do something like that. Um, yeah, in yeah. 2018, we're talking about this just happened. This was all, even though we're dealing with all the craziness of the election now, but, you know, that was on our ballot as well for yeah. this city. And, like, I'm just like, people, like, you think that's the objective, but that really should not be our no. trajectory. You're not welcome there. Your children right. are welcome there. No, no. Right. Oh. And we we gotta understand it. We gotta. I hope we wake up to it sooner than later. That's my biggest thing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Right. So go ahead and tell the viewers how to find you, how to contact you, give out your social media information, and all that. And thank you for this awesome interview today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is nice. So you guys can find me on Instagram at Real Estate and Chill, and you can also find me on Facebook at Real Estate and Chill. Also, um, if you want to email me. It's PONGB, that's P-O-N-G-E-E, B at AOL.com. And is there any other way? Oh, I have a YouTube channel, uh, Real Estate and Chill as well. So if you guys, yeah, check me out on any of those platforms and I'll reach out to you. 
Nice. So thank you for joining us on Intellectual Chocolate. I'm your host, Ronique West. I had Panji. She was a real estate and chill author guru. Make sure you follow her at Real Estate and Chill on Instagram. I got that right, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Real estate and chill on Instagram. Now, if you know anybody that has something brilliant to say, we're looking for more brilliant black minds to interview, go to intellectualchocolate.com and don't forget to check out the Black Business School. And again, I'll catch you next time on Intellectual Chocolate. And if you want to follow me, follow me on Instagram at Ronique M. West and you can find out everything I have going on. I'll catch you guys later. Thank you.